our academic uh, programs include shamanic practice, applied shamanism, um, applied Buddhist psychology, and integrated energy medicine. And we also have a series of classes that we teach uh, in the department called Empowered Living, which is um, it basically therapy for people that don't want to go to therapy. It's, you know, it, it, there, it comes out of my depth hypnosis practice. And I, I have a, you know, I still see, I used to see about 30 to 35 people a week. I'm down to about 15 to 20 now. Um, but I still have my private practice. I spend most of my time uh, uh, teaching. And, um, but the Empowered Living classes come out of my spiritual counseling practice of depth hypnosis because um, there are certain passages or gates that everyone walks through in their lifetimes. And those classes try to uh, address some of the issues that come up um, in that process. So we have tracking spirit in the birth environment, the sacred feminine, which I'm now teaching part of that with Bob, the sacred masculine. Then I have three classes on relationships, relationships and karma, relationships and power, uh, the inner self and relationship, and then grief and loss and the worlds beyond death. So you can see it's a, you know, a cycle. And the, when I'm training people to do depth hypnosis work, I'm, I'm helping them to s learn how to facilitate people's experience moving through those gates. And so the main thing that I do is develop healers. That's the, that's the main thing I do, actually. So I'm, only, I'm sort of like a, you know, I kind of pretend that I'm just helping people, you know, heal from whatever symptom they have, but I'm actually a recruitment sergeant in, uh, in disguise, looking for police officers that are got their panties in a wad, want to get them untwisted and get back on the line. So, <laughs> so I'm coming out of the closet right now, just so you know. <laughs> so, so I'm really excited to be here to uh, teach with Bob. Yeah, you know, Bob, I've just loved you for so long, and it's just wonderful to to teach with you and you know and I'm really looking forward to this. This is a highlight of my year to come teach here and be at Nema and be with you and, and to meet everyone here and talk to the mouse who always steals my acorns off my off my altar. <laughs> I brought three acorns to offer the mice. Those three, not the other one. <laughs> so um so uh, what I'd like to do uh, is go at, oh, kind of go over what we're going to be doing this weekend. Um, and of course, you never know with Bob what we're actually going to do. But my uh, the general idea is, um, of course, that we're going to be talking about the shamanic, the intersection between shamanism and Buddhism, of course. And uh, you know, it's interesting to think about the two paths coming together at an intersection because. The more you go into both of these subjects, the more you're going to see that they're actually coming out of the same place as well. So it's interesting. We're going to be coming this way, and then pretty soon you're going to see there's this as well. So, um, so what we're going to be doing tonight, I'll be going over um, a lecture talking about the similarities and the differences between the two paths, just some general thoughts. Um, and uh, then Bob will be offering some some insights. And then, generally speaking, I will be teaching in the morning, and Bob will be teaching from 4 to 6, and then we'll be doing question and answer, although I do have a little bit of lecture I'd like to sneak in at night, if that's okay. Um, because I, there's a ton of material that I want to cover. <laughs> I just want to make sure we have time. So. Um, so tomorrow morning, what we'll be doing is we'll be learning about the shamanic journey. So the thing, when, you, when you're looking at these two paths, shamanism and Buddhism, you're looking at methods of transformation of consciousness. And um, so we're going to be focusing on two of the vehicles that are used, the two primary vehicles that are used each in, in each tradition, one in each tradition, that are fundamental to the transformation of consciousness. And um, so we're going to be looking tomorrow at the shamanic journey. I'm going to be teaching you how to journey, 
how to establish a relationship with inner guidance um, in the form of nature in the way that shamans have done for millennia. And then um, in the afternoon, Bob will be offering you insights about shamans and siddhas. And then tomorrow night, um, I'm going to be focusing on understanding the, the way in which ritual is used in both, um, both traditions it's one of, it, 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 as a method of revealing wisdom. And so we'll be talking about that. And then uh, we're actually going to be um, develop. You're going to be developing your own ritual through the interaction with the guides that you meet in the journey. And also um, on Sunday morning, we're going to be working with deity meditation. And you may have guessed that the deity that we're going to be working with is none other than Vajrasattva. As we, and thank you to everyone who uh, helped print this wonderful <coughs> big semi conca out. And, um, and everyone who brought, um, Craig and everyone who brought the Vajrasattva, uh, and uh, Justin who brought the statue and the images. I wanted to make sure that you actually knew who Vajrasattva was. <laughs> so before you try to do a deity meditation with it. So um, so we'll be looking at, you know, we're, we're not going to be doing the, you know, kind of official deity meditations that are done in Tantric Buddhism. We're going to be doing something a little bit stepped down because we're not doing all the generation and creation stages. But I, I want to give you a flavor and it's, I've, I've figured out a way to do that so that you can um, begin to work with uh, this particular deity who is sometimes called the gateway to the Tantra because of um, the purification practices that it offers and that is part of its field of experience. And um, you know, as you are moving into deeper and deeper understanding of the shamanic path and the Buddhist path, it's always a good moment to, to go through some initiations of purification, no matter how long you've been on the path, no matter if you've just started or if you've been on the path for many years, it's always a good moment to, to find a level within you that might need purification and then work with the, the rituals and the initiatory processes, which is the subject of the um, lecture on Sunday night. And uh, then on um, Sunday we'll be putting, uh, on Monday morning we'll be putting it all together and doing a big process uh, experientially. So I tend to teach very experientially. Bob tends to teach by blowing your mind. <laughs> 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 and um, so uh, you'll see we kind of go back and forth between those processes. but. That will be the gen that's the general, that's what we'll generally be covering this weekend. I'm also, um, um, tomorrow afternoon, just in case you're interested, I have a new book coming out called Coming to Peace. And the subtitle we haven't decided on, but the one that I want is um, Finding Peace in the Heart of Conflict. It's a, it's a method of conflict resolution that is drawn from the Algonquin, um, the uh, Pacific Island, and the African traditions of Ubuntu, and the Pacific Island traditions of Ho'oponopono, and the Algonquin process of the caucus. And uh, the interesting thing is that those three traditions, which arose on completely different parts of the planet, all have a very similar conflict resolution process. And um, I talk about that in the book, and I'm going, and then I talk about how to work with uh, that process, not only in uh, external community and family uh, resolution processes, this is the heart of the death hypnosis, family and, and <coughs> couples work, but um, also how to work with it internally to solve inner conflict. So I'll be doing a reading about that at 2.30 tomorrow afternoon, if you're interested, I'll be reading from the book. And um, I may, if uh, it's the right time or the right thing, I may do some channeling on Sunday afternoon, if that's 
something that should happen. So, um, so that's the schedule. I think that's and and then you have every afternoon you have lots of time uh, between lunch and the four o'clock. I will be giving you a little bit of homework um, because I can't resist. But that's the time to go to the spa. <laughs> so you have plenty of spa time, and of course in the evening as well. Hi, I, um, I skipped the announcements, which I shouldn't have done. Um, just to say that <clears throat> there's also um, Tibetan Nijang uh, <coughs> longevity yoga uh, being taught by my wife Shisti, who also helps at the spa. Um, and that's uh, from 7 to 8 in the morning prior to breakfast. And I'm so sorry I didn't do my homework, but is that here? No, it's in the yoga center. In the yoga studio? Yeah. Okay. It's in the yoga studio, which is the building... Um, that is just past our organic garden, uh, if you're walking from this side of campus. And um, those practices are truly extraordinary. They're very easy to do, very invigorating, and um, I, I highly recommend them. And then also one thing I forgot is that we do have um, a friend who's going to be taking some video uh, tomorrow and Sunday. and. Uh, this is for a, this is not for something for sale. This is a promotional video that we're finally sort of putting together for Tibet House in Menla. And if anyone does not want to be in it, <clears throat> please do let us know. Um, otherwise, we're going to assume that it's okay. And uh, if you're interested and he, you know, some of the vibe like happens, he may want to do a short interview just to see about your experience here. Uh, and that's all very helpful to us because we have very little footage of what goes on here. Most of it's uh, recorded in the third eye and not viewable by the public. <laughs> so the yoga is actually happening here. That's what I thought. Right. Yeah. She let's do another yoga class, but the one for this group is in here. That's what I thought. All right, good. Yeah, so 7 a.m. right here. And these are the longevity practices. So the fountain of youth is to be found here from 7 to 8 in the morning. These are practices you can learn and do for yourself at home. Do we need to bring our own mats for the yoga class? We do have some mats, some props here. Yeah, you shouldn't need to bring anything except your, yourself. And that's it. Thank you, sorry. No, that's great. So does anyone have any questions about the format, the schedule, anything like that? Okay, so Bob, do you want to do a little talking and then yes. I'll do a little talking? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, I was just thinking about uh, what to share with you. And um, I think that uh, I would like to introduce to you the sort of Buddhist view of reality, which maybe underlies the world of the shaman and the world of the siddha. And maybe the best way to do that is for us to meditate together. And I will do a guided thing rather than to just. Uh, what we're talking about, let's try to just try to try to sort of have a taste of this kind of reality and that underlies things like the white power and the Bodhisattva and sort of spirit travel and journeys and things. What is what what is it? Where are we? What are we doing here? Sort of thing <laughs> from the point of view of um, the Buddha's discovery. What is the Buddha's discovery? of our reality and why did that uh, why did that last so long in the world and why is it still considered useful by many people and in a way why did he discover that sitting under a tree uh, in a classic uh, shamanic position so let's meditate on this now so there is a concept called emptiness or uh, voidness sometimes people call it which uh, or also selflessness it can be called which is one of the ways that the Buddha described his discovery and the Buddha was someone who decided that he didn't want to proceed with his life as a king, a 
as a husband, as a family person, as a member of his society, until he could understand what was the reality of their life. What is it? So he set himself to try to discover that. He was brought up to be a prince and then a king, and educated in the way that a king was in those days, which in a way still is the way that uh, you know, commander-in-chief is supposed to be uh, educated to defend a country, to make judgments about what is fair and unfair, what is right and wrong in a, city, in a society, and um, to serve the people, the subjects, with, and help them confront their problems and help them have a good life in, within the sphere of his kingdom. And he found uh, himself that the way he was educated traditionally to do that, leaving sort of ultimate questions to the priests uh, of the religion of his time, which was known as, which we could call Vedism. It was really not really Hinduism at that time, but rather Vedism would be a better term. And uh, at the time when he was asked to accede to the throne, he found himself, he felt he was unprepared. He felt that he didn't really know how to handle people's main problems. Uh, mainly, of course, everyone's problem was the problem of suffering. And he couldn't really address that. And he felt that as a ruler, he could maybe ameliorate some of the superficial things, but basically he couldn't deal with that major problem. And his father at the time said, well, the priests take care of that, you know, and they intercede with the gods for people to deal with the basic sufferings of life. And Buddha rightfully said, you know, perspicaciously said, they're doing a lousy job. <laughs> so I think you could do better. So I'm going to set myself to do that. So, meaning that he would set himself to discover the nature of reality, so that he would be sure that whatever it was that he, however he handled the people that depended on him, that he would be able to lead them in a way where they might actually lessen their suffering, and they might find their goal, achieve their goal, which is to, to find happiness of some kind. So then he went for six years in the forest. Well, first, at the beginning of this six-year retreat, where he became a shramana, the Sanskrit word is shramana, which there are some theories that they think this is the origin of the word shramana in, um, in Asia. And uh, shramana means one who basically um, goes to on retreat. I like the people translate as that as ascetic, because for a while he lived very sparse, sparsely. And uh, under underwent what people might, other people might think of as tremendous uh, physical hardship and mortification and suffering, but actually that's not what shramana means. Shramana really means a vacationer, actually. I'd say someone who decides to take a break from the ordinary what we what we call in the modern times we say rat race. Yeah. You know, you have your profession, have your skill, get your certification, and training your degree, and then go out and work, earn a living, and go through life, hopefully being successful, maybe being of help to others, hopefully not exploiting them, hopefully, and then basically dying, and losing whatever it is you made in life, although then luckily maybe having generated some other generation, offspring and having them carry on. But what was it all for? What was it all about? What happens beyond death, actually? So all of these questions, he felt he couldn't be sure of the answers. So he wanted to discover what they were. So let's, let's think of ourselves now. Now in meditating, what are you looking at yourself? Who are you? So sort of a way of doing that is to imagine that you are looking into your own face somehow. 
and in order to sort of discover your identity. Of course, you know your name, and for, us, for example, let's say I'm called Bob, but when I look into my face, where is the Bob? Is it land somewhere in my brain, in my heart, in my physical body, in my <clears throat> mental body, in my consciousness? When you do that with your own identity, you have a name, you look back into yourself, where does that name land? If you even think I were to look into myself, where does the I come from? What does, to what does the I refer? When we say look into, then we're mentally looking actually, because of course we can't really look back into our own eyeball. So we're mentally sort of surveying, scanning, picture we have of our body and mind complex to see actually really what it really is. We, if we're medically trained, we maybe have a picture of our anatomy in great detail. If we're scientifically trained in physics, we might have a picture of ourselves as some kind of collocation of cells and molecules and then components of the molecules are atoms, if we've heard something of quantum physics, high energy particle physics, we might be wondering what the atom is made of, what the nucleus of the atom is made of, is there seem to be a difference between the atoms that are within our skin and those that are outside of our skin, or the atoms that are our skin. <laughs> when we look into ourself in a concentrated way. Together now we're doing that. If we're looking carefully, we should feel at this moment maybe a little dizzy, a little bit disoriented. Because we don't find, I don't find Bob printed on an atom. I don't find it printed on my heart. I don't find it printed in my brain. It's a sound bob. It can be written in English letters, B-O-B. Other languages have other kinds of letters that don't look like a B or an O or a B. So when you look, carefully at yourself, the way you would look at anything to discover what it is, analytically, you should feel a little disoriented. Feeling a little disoriented is good. You shouldn't feel uncomfortable with it. I mean, well, in fact, you do feel a little uncomfortable with being disoriented, but you should explore that rather than shrink from it. Why is it that looking to see what you really are makes you feel a little disoriented? Since when you are rushing forward in life, accomplishing something, doing something, reacting to things, you seem to sort of function without question as to what you are, mostly. This is what the Buddha did. He looked into himself in this way. So you are doing what he did. He had a different kind of atomic model, but he, in those days they did have a kind of atomic model. Atoms of Earth, water, fire, wind, 
and even sort of units of space. We can do one more complicated one, but interestingly, even then, he discounted or he saw through the idea that there was an indivisible solid building block of it all, which has only been discovered recently by quantum, about a century ago, by quantum physicists, that the, even the nucleus of the atom, even the electron of the atom, even the photon of light, they couldn't pin it down, they couldn't find an irreducible entity. So when you feel disoriented, you feeling that you can't really find the Bob particle, or whatever your name is, in your, in your case, the ESA particle, the nanoparticle, the solar particle, the nanoparticle, and then you feel disoriented, that's a step forward. Now what Buddha discovered was that when you he concentrated on in that way over many years, in his case, although he made quick progress actually first and then spent more time, <coughs> found that there's a layer of pure light in consciousness itself. And that light is kind of beyond location. It's, it's like just spacious light. And first it's a kind of whitish, moonlit space that he found. And he lost track of the difference between what was within the skin and outside of the skin. And he felt that the white light space in the consciousness that was within him, sort of, like as when you think of within, like contained within the body, the consciousness is not really contained within the body. Consciousness can spread out beyond the body. And this light was a kind of layer, seemed to it, and endless actually. But it was not a threatening endlessness because the sense of a point apart from it disappeared. So he just felt the kind of release in a space of white light. Some of you, if you have done meditation practice, you might have had a taste of such an experience. But that is not emptiness. In a way, relative to being a feeling, you're a solid body with your identity. It feels like, a, like an openness. But it isn't actually what is meant by the technical term emptiness, shunyata, that the Buddha used. But then some aspect of the consciousness that's used to being your subjective consciousness, sort of under your control or controlling you, maybe sort of your possession or possessing you, feels uncomfortable just sort of spreading through vast white space. And in a way that discomfort might express itself meditatively by your consciousness itself kind of exploding to, to encompass that space. And as your consciousness explodes to encompass that space, it becomes brighter and brighter, and it has a more orange, reddish glow to it, like a solar and a brighter, it's the sense of wishing to assert yourself gives you kind of a bright solar space. Oh, it can even be brilliant if you like a brilliant, and sometimes in some texts they say like a thousand suns. Which you might imagine now. But then, when you, if you can imagine that, you would imagine that 
it might almost feel uncomfortable, like almost too hot, too bright, sort of searing. Although you, in a way, don't have a separated thing that is being seared, but you are the searing. So you seek to be cool, and maybe you think of when you were most cool and relaxed, which was when you were at the brink of sleep. So then you might have an experience of a kind of vast darkness, which might be experienced as a kind of relief. Like almost like you're falling asleep now and meditating. You're meditating. You're not frightened of losing consciousness because you're remembering that when you fall asleep, you're very happy to lose consciousness. You're tired of that day of the dealing with everything, and you're seeking to lose consciousness. And it seems to be a place to rest. So then your meditation, you go into a deep rest, perhaps. And imagine this being a blackness, a darkness that is so dark that it's almost like a bright blackness. But it's truly darkness. And that is you. So it's not like you are lost in the dark. You are the dark. Try to imagine that. Then, before you do actually talk out, imagine being still at some very subtle level aware that you're sort of at the event horizon of unconsciousness. So you're consciously unconscious, if you can imagine, I imagine, that inexpressible contradictory thing. And then imagine as if everything was kind of transparency, like a like glass, like a crystal. And the crystal kind of reflected the darkness and the brightness and the whiteness. But in a way it didn't have a separate light of its own. And it being transparent, Unlike a realm of pure white space, unlike a realm of pure solar space, sun space, unlike a realm of pure dark consciousness, being transparent, all the differentiated things, your body, the bodies of others, the building, the planet, the ground, the sky, solar system, everything becomes like this transparent. No obstruction. It's all there, but it's like when you look at a set of transparent objects. You have to make a special effort to pick out the, the discernible, separable object, because it's, you can see through it also at the same time. And this is called the clear light. That's just being on the clear. But in a way, it really means transparency. Just imagine that your mind, that you now are feeling one with everything in the universe. And it is all transparent to you. There is no shadow. There is no obstruction. It's all where it was, and you yourself are where you were. But you're not so much separated from it by being inside your skin. Although you're not not inside your skin, but you're also simultaneously everywhere else. And there's no more a sense of explosion or a sense of contraction. There's no more a sense of sort of me versus everything else. Because in a way, you are everything. So you don't need to move here or there. You feel you are everywhere. And in a way, time also becomes kind of, you're sort of everywhere in time.
that's where as transparency feels to you. Like you're discovering where you always already have been. It's not like it's some new place. You can only settle in it, kind of, or as it. First in it and then as it. It's a great peace. But it's not a dead peace, like just sort of dead. It's like a vibrant peace. And you have a sense, although you, you don't pursue it, but you have a sense that at any point that you want to manifest something, there would be a plane of infinity, an infinity of energy at any point. Everything else would also simultaneously be that point. That point would not be separate from everything else, but yet it could be, it could be focused on. All of what I'm saying, of course, is contradictory, paradoxical. One of the aspects of it is that it does not match any particular concept that one might have. But, it can be experienced, Buddha claimed. And if we approach, as we sort of approach it through the realm of the moonlight, sunlight, and the dark light, we kind of feel familiar like we know it. So it's like just simply coming to the deepest level of being. Although in a way it's beyond non-being, it's beyond any duality of being and non-being. There's no other place than it, so there's no non-being, therefore it's not really being in contrast with non-being. But they call it's called clear light of the void or transparency of empty. Tonight when you sleep, special men on sleep yoga, you simply decide before falling asleep that once you are asleep. Although your consciousness is no longer functioning in its differentiating habit, and therefore you are blissfully not worrying about it, it is not lying in a dark space, and your body is not lying in a dark space. You're in a dark room as far as your physical senses go, but you're ultimately not lying in a dark space. You're ultimately simply resting in a fusion with this infinite transparency, which is the deepest being, and which is undifferentiable actually from Buddha's deepest being, or anybody else's deepest being. And yet there can be individual manifestations within it, simultaneously with being undifferentiable. A Buddhist who is aware of this, even if still only theoretically, or what one might say intellectually, but if you have a little hint of it even intellectually, that is a kind of experience. We shouldn't really discount intellectual experience from visceral experience. It's the visceral experience is just deeper and more total. But it doesn't exclude intellectual experience. There's a wrong idea that floats around in the spiritual circles that somehow you have to crush your intelligence to have this kind of understanding, and that is really unfortunate. Because in a way, your experientiality is aimed, and aimed toward what you can understand as sort of 
cosmic openness. You kind of understand that it's beyond a closed understanding, but your understanding aims you to open. So when you then awaken, or come out of such a meditation, you kind of rise up into the being consciously aware of the darkness from the transparency. But in a way, you know you're, in a way you never leave the transparency, you just don't pay attention to it. It's like there, like the knowledge you have when you look in a mirror that you're seeing a mirror reflection. It's there intuitively that you're one with this vast, transparency, and yet you manifest, like when you look at a mirror reflection and you pay attention to what's reflected there, but you know it's just a reflection. You have an intuition that it's a reflection. So therefore, when you rise up back into some kind of differentiated experience, you simultaneously know that there's no rising up or leaving the vastness. But you're choosing to manifest for a purpose. Then you come into the solar energy level, then you come into the lunar energy level, then you sort of re-enter the body through stages if you wish, or all at once. And now you're in a body that has a sense of connectedness to the infinite in the sense that it is really the infinite and its sense of being a separated body is like the illusory quality of a mirror reflection. So this Sindhi, your individual body, is now like a reflection in this vast transparency. But you're paying attention to your differentiated state and yet you feel a terrific new energy because in a way you feel that the whole there, the whole the infinite is there with you. It's expressing through you without unexpressing anywhere else because it has, it's an infinite plenitude. It's a pure love in that sense in that it's able to fulfill any need without depleting itself. It's a miracle. Now, White Tara, in the picture there that is a point it out to you. Tara means savioress. A female savior from suffering. Healer of suffering. Her whiteness kind of indicates the moonlit level, but then beneath is the solar level, the dark level, non-duly and the transparency. She's considered the emanation in her many forms. She's not just one form. She can infinitely emanate as many beings as need to see her as a doorway to this infinite plenum reality of infinite loving energy. But not of any particular person, but of every loving person divine, human, enlightened, unenlightened, whatever element of pure love, that's the transparency. So she emanates in order to represent this miracle working power. So Tara is considered the emanation of the miraculous activity of all infinite numbers of enlightened beings throughout all space and time. Therefore, she has this tremendous healing power. And now you can imagine Tara in your presence. And imagine her
touching your space element, sharing her sense of full awareness of all levels of her embodiment, so that you are enfolded in a nurturing darkness. You have a layer of pure darkness that is utterly nurturing, utterly healing. It's dark so you can't see it. <laughs> So, but you just know it's there. And then it's, in addition there's this reddish solar energy, like ruby. There's a ruby envelope around you too. And then there's a pearl-like envelope around you. And when these envelopes enfold you, all of your atoms and molecules and cells are nurtured and they perceive that whatever color, whatever type of energy they need from this envelope of the healing power. And the solid elements in your body receive a golden feeling, pure gold. An envelope of pure luminous gold. Each of these envelopes you can imagine, sort of like when people in the transporter room in Star Trek beam out or in. There's a moment there where their bodies are sparkles. Pure sparkle, the outline of their body fills with sparkles. If you remember, I hope everyone's seen a Star Trek or two. New generation. Then one can, depending on what one feels one needs, one can have a blue sapphire envelope, one can have a green emerald envelope, and one can have a brown earthy envelope, you know, the outer, outermost level. As you develop a real knowledge and a relationship and a friendliness with power, they say, by doing these meditations of these elemental envelopes, you can live a very long time. You can, they will help your telomeres. <laughs> they will fix up your telomeres. And then you can visualize Tara is in front of you also, smiling at you, radiating to you or you, energy in the form of kind of liquid light, or whatever color you feel you need. But you do it in such a way that you don't feel somehow that you're inferior or that you have to worship this person or whatever it is. Because she's just a doorway. She can merge. She, from her perspective, is one with you, ready to share with you her miraculous presence. And she does that seeing you as more important than herself, which is the nature of a loving space, a loving being. Loving being is not looking at you like I'm loving you and I'm somehow better than you. Loving being is whatever you need radiates to you. If you meditate this power, she can help you stop smoking. For example. Main point being, in concluding of the meditation, try to reflect that whether we know it or not, the deepest layer of the universe, let's say the deepest reality of the universe, 
is not something beyond all the differentiated things. Non-duality is worth how it is described by the sort of highest descriptions. And this ultimate reality is all of the things. It is all of the differentiated things in, indivisibly. There's a wonderful expression by the great Nagarjuna, one of the sometimes called second Buddha, one of the greatest teachers of humanity, which is that this high reality is called emptiness, the womb of love and compassion. And the womb statement is, means that you know, we tend to think when we think of like a vast crystal of diamond space, of transparency, as if it were something sort of we have to get beyond our perception of ordinary things to reach. And there is a kind of process of casting, of seeing through ordinary things when we first experience it. But when we do experience it, it's like it's always been there, we become aware of it, we truly experience it. And then we realize we haven't left anywhere, we haven't gone anywhere. We always have been there. So similarly, therefore, when we visualize like Tara, or when we visualize Vajrasattva, or what's so-called deity, or when we imagine historical Buddha, or when we think of any other being, they are not separate from this crystal realm. And so our visualization, although if we don't have a very strong level of concentration, usually it can only reflash in the mind. Like, like right now, if you think about your best friend's face, it may be only, you, your mind won't stably hold it right in front of you for more than a few seconds, if that because our mind is mostly not trained to stay just focused on one thing, although we can learn to do that. But, uh, but in this case, what is kind of encouraging is that when we think, of, if we would say visualizing Tara, or visualizing Vajrasattva, or visualizing Medicine Buddha, which is after which Menla is named, Menla means Medicine Buddha, our vision of that being as a presence is actually realistic because enlightened beings have an infinite consciousness and an eternal one. And they are one with us in all space and time, so they really are present here. And they want to nurture us, and they, that's, their, that's their infinite will, their infinite energy, their infinite love. So when we, instead of thinking we were wandering alone in the woods or something, we imagine Tara is with us, or we're in some valley in the Catskills, we, we imagine that there's a host of medicine Buddhas with us. In fact, there is a host of medicine Buddhas with us. There is a host of Taras with us. Not, of course, not just here, but not everywhere. So we're actually getting deeper to reality, rather than just having a sort of separated fantasy. That's a kind of encouraging thing. See, that's the non-duality thing that we should try to remember. It's very contrary to what we're taught in our culture, and not just in the West, in the East as well, in the China and Japan and Tibet, everywhere where there are human hierarchies and their bosses and their masters and their rulers leases or whatever, their military or high priests, everywhere where they are, they always want to present themselves as being the medium through which you can reach some sort of ultimate satisfaction. And therefore, in order to make themselves indispensable to you, they convince you, the different cultures convince you that you are alienated from ultimate satisfaction, that there's something wrong not quite right with you that there's something wrong with you, that, that there's something wrong with reality. Like some religions, for example, would say, you know, if you don't do this, don't do that, you're going to go to hell. Like as if there were a deep, horrible place, that, that sort of default place that you might go to. So in this 
tradition, as I think in the nature traditions, mostly, the default position is that it's all good. If you lose all control, if you let it all go, you feed yourself to the bear, you just let yourself just fly to pieces. The pieces will be held in the nurturing womb of reality. They'll be held with love. Love will see to it that you're happy and you don't suffer. Anybody have a question? Can you repeat that? No, I, just <laughs> <laughs> I can hear that. Can you repeat that? Can you repeat that? Just a joke. <laughs> Any questions? How can you repeat that? <laughs> we have a, we took audio. We can share it with you after the uh-huh. Yes, you have a question? Yeah, my question was, how can we repeat it? How can they repeat the meditation? How can they repeat it? Yes. Well, easily. You have to repeat it at Menla. It is mandatory sleep yoga. <laughs> <laughs> so as you fall asleep, you think, and actually this is well described in the, what's in the, te- the text that I bring to the, to the retreat, which is uh, my translation and study of the Tibetan Book of the Dead which I hope we have around, and if not, we can make some copies or something, we can at least have one copy available around. Um, yeah. You know, it's, you can get an e-book for, for, I hope, five bucks or ten bucks or something, if you want to have it in your phone. And <clears throat> although your phone won't connect out here. <laughs> no, but, uh, except through the internet, maybe. But, um, you know, there's a, this, this sort of, um, notion of the clear light of the void and the layers of moonlit, sunlit, darklit, and then the earth, water, fire, wind, space, sort of coarse reality levels. That's sort of a really good formula to, for a formulation to get a sense of. And then uh, when you do, then when you have a sense to, to sit, or when you like to concentrate or be mindful a little bit, you you can sort of go down through that like an arpeggio or something. And then you come to the clear light, you know. But, but, the, but the, you know, when you want to actually sort of concentrate or something. And falling asleep is a very good time to do it. Because I think people find that if you imagine ahead of time that when you sleep, you're sort of, you, your head is held on your pillow, but the pillow itself is held in the lap of Tara, of the loving Buddha, female Buddha, mother being. So you're sort of like in your mother's lap, your ultimate mother's lap, and uh, total nurturing and so on. And then you'll be more rested in the morning. Then when we, we normally have, a, we, our culture tells us, A, that when we die we're going to be nothing, and that was some weird religious claptrap about having a continuity of mind, which they insisted that they've discovered scientifically, yet have no evidence and no proof of nothing, nobody ever will. And then they, therefore, we think subconsciously that when we fall asleep, 
we sort of have a, per, a preview of being nothing. We're in a realm of dark unconsciousness. And then we purport to be scared of that, but actually every night we welcome it. Give me an ambient in case I'm not sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Just like the materialist falsely convinces themselves that the consequences of how they lived and how their consciousness is terminate at death. So it can't ever get worse than that. <laughs> you know, they can't get really depressed in the next life. And, uh, which is, you know, contrary to any example of anything in nature that everything is continuity. <coughs> And if you know that, then you're going to always try to be in a positive mind. So, but the best thing is that, so that's one way, you know, when you want to actually concentrate. But then the main thing, then the main thing is, meditate, then the default thing, that I am loved by reality, infinitely. And you don't have to have God, you don't have to have the Goddess, you don't, I mean, you could, you don't have to. It's just the diamond light of the void. It's clear light. You know, there is no nothing. The void does not mean nothing. Void means everything is relative. So the actual nature of all this relativity is this wonderful, blissful diamond luminosity. And it takes an effort when you reflect on that, constantly return to it in your mind then you should pay attention to the questioner in your mind that says, why is this? Why? Yeah. You know, really, at the base of everything is nothing. When you take something apart and analyze it, you don't find the atom, you don't find the something or particle, you don't find the Higgs boson. It's all nothing. That's a realistic thing. But then, that's insane. Nothing is not there. Only nothing is, can be nothing. No something can be nothing. It means it's no, there's no reference for it. So the something of the default position is this infinite energy. And it's so infinite, it doesn't do anything to us. It doesn't demand anything of us. It's not swooshing us this way or that way. But it's, we can swoosh, if we tap into it, we can swoosh whatever way we want. It's there to satisfy, whatever. That's happiness. So there's a, you know, it's like the idea that, okay, I'm so dissatisfied, I'm so upset. I really am going to be upset if, if, if this country elects like some kind of object <laughs> war <laughs> to hold power over our lives and deaths. I will be really upset. So even if the moron is there, it's all, it's all good. Even if it's the worst possible thing. Even if the death star blows up the planet. Yeah. It'll all be good. So, but on that basis, we don't want to go through having to make a new planet because some idiot blew up the old one. So we're going to do our best drawing on infinite energy to see to it that, that the relative things we deal with are better and not worse. As I constantly say to my dear and beloved Ralph Nader, Dear Ralph, please contemplate with your Princeton intellect the syllogism. Lesser of evils equals less evil. <laughs> Still to no avail. And I wish I could convey that somehow in a massive tweet to all the young people who think that, oh, I don't care. Oh, I don't like her. Maybe I'll vote for this, for space, you know. Maybe I'll vote for Mars. You know. Elon Musk is running off to Mars, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> but the only person who can manage Mars is Arnold. <laughs> remember? His eyes were almost bugging out, and then somebody gave him like an oxygen mask or something. Remember that? He landed on the ground, and Mars was like, bam, boom. Oh, yeah. Sort of dick. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry, I don't want to keep you up with my chat. But that's the thing to do. So there's two levels. In other words, you want to meditate, you can learn the eightfold thing. And, and you know, like consciously meditate. But then all the time we are meditating, so all the time catch ourselves 
catch ourselves in our moments of quiet desperation, as Mr. Thoreau called it brilliantly, like two centuries ago. The mass of men today lead lives of quiet desperation. He's already talking about that in an industrial barbaric society. And then, and when we sort of catch ourselves feeling really panicked and stressed, like I've been feeling all week, okay. then catch that, oh wait, it's just a lot. It's all good. And I'm very happy now because I was told myself that I'll be unstressed in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm 80, and until then, just forget about it. <laughs> and don't be freaked out about being freaked out. Nobody <laughs> knows what I'm talking about. Michael and I are trying to finish a book by a dead body. Oh, uh, 300 page book, oh. graphic novel, about the Dalai Lama's life, and very kind of freaked me out. It's almost done. Anyway, that's all. Have a nice time. <laughs>